Greetings to all and thank you for joining us for this webinar titled Bringing a Franchise Brand to the GCC Region. My name is Troy Franklin and I'm the managing partner of World Franchise Associates, a leading global franchise marketing and advisory company based out of the United Kingdom and with offices around the world and, and partnerships in all regions of the, uh, the globe. And I'll be hosting or moderating the webinar. And uh, the webinar is brought to you by Index Conferences and Exhibitions and the Franchise Talk uh, newsletter, The Voice of Franchising in the Middle East. And again, the topic is bringing a franchise brand to the GCC region. And I have the pleasure of being joined today by two friends and, and associates of World Franchise Associates. Uh, the first I'll introduce is Hesham Murad. He's the managing partner of Hetma Consulting uh, based out of Qatar. And uh, Mr. David Singleton, who is a partner and a strategic advisor of Socius and David is based in Dubai. And the three of us will be talking to you about the following agenda items. I'll briefly introduce my company um, and uh, talk to you about why GCC is attractive to franchisees. And in other words, why brands are interested in finding partners in the GCC and, and broader M and EA region. Then I'll hand it over to Hesham, and Hesham will talk to you about key considerations for bringing a franchise brand to the GCC region. So if you're looking to acquire a franchise, uh, what do you need to think about in terms of, of making the decision to, to bring the franchise? What, what are you looking for? What should you uh, think about in terms of key considerations and, uh, and important questions that you need to ask? Uh, we'll move from there to David, and David will We'll give you some insights in, into what it takes to successfully launch and grow a franchise in the GCC region. Uh, you're going to see some overlap in, in what we talk about today um, in some areas, but effectively, once we've all three spoken, you should have a, a very good insight into what is important when you look to bring a brand, a franchise brand, to, to the GCC or broader MNEA region. And, uh, at the end of our presentation, we'll open the uh, floor to questions, which you can you can type in, and we'll I'll read the questions, and either myself or Hesham or David will will try to uh, do our best to answer any questions you may have. So don't be shy about asking questions. Uh, we're here to uh, to uh, answer your questions and uh, and uh, help educate you on this topic and. Uh, I think combined between the three of us, we probably have 50 or 60 or more years of experience. Um, so, uh, you know, we've, we've been uh, working in the GCC and MNEA region. Uh, some of us have lived there and very familiar with, uh, with, the, with the region. So just very quickly about my company. We are a Leading international franchise sales, marketing, development, and advisory company. As I said, we're based in, in, in the UK and uh, offices in strategic markets. We help brands expand outside of their, their borders, expand internationally through marketing and sales programs. We also help brands with systems, tools, and process development. And we run advisory programs to help brands that want to bring clients or brands to their, to their country. Uh, we also do government and institutional programs. Uh, we've worked with the Saudi government. We've done some work with the Qatar government through the QDB, uh, with the Malaysian government, and with franchise associations across multiple uh, regions, countries and regions. So just a couple of quick slides on why brands want to enter the GCC. Um, one is the GCC is the economic engine of the Middle East and North Africa region. Uh, it has established incredible IP laws. Um, there's a very developed infrastructure. 
there's a great deal of, of economic stability, uh, political stability, and est established franchise proof of concept. I think I've just been told that you're not seeing my presentation, which is, if it's the case, uh, my sincere apologies. Let's give it another try. So, Picking up where I, I left off, the GCC is the economic engine of the MNEA region. There's established and credible IP laws, um, a developed infrastructure, as I said, economic stability, political stability, and established franchise proof of concept. And if you look at the broader MNEA region and why that uh, region is attractive to brands and franchisors, um, it's a fairly significant region with more than 300 million people. Um, Egypt obviously accounts for a lot of that. Um, it has a, a reasonably fast population growth of 3 to 5 percent a year. Um, one of the franchise associations in the region has established that the sector sales exceeded 30 billion. This is a couple of this pre-COVID, uh, but I would imagine that this number would continue to grow. Uh, generally, most of the countries are investor friendly. Uh, there's a, a solid infrastructure, particularly in the GCC, but also in other parts of the of the region. Uh, there are a lot of, of substantial companies that can op operate across multiple countries in the region, which is not the case in many parts of the world. Uh, there are high net worth individuals and uh, lots of young, upwardly mobile um, consumers. For anyone that's looking to bring brands to the GCC region or the Middle East, North Africa region, uh, I would tell you that we represent more than 200 brands across uh, both food and non-food categories. You can learn more about those brands from our World Franchise Center at www.worldfranchisecenter.com. Just some brands that you may recognize that are looking to get into the region, some major brands, TGI Fridays, Long John Silver's, a Weiner Schnitzel, the Coffee Club, uh, the Pizza Company, Thai Express, uh, Bose Coffee, and and others. And that uh, concludes my presentation. I apologize for the mix-up with the screen sharing. I hope that uh, wasn't too disruptive. Um, we're going to turn it over now to to Hesham. Uh, again, Hesham is the managing partner of Hecma Consulting. HECMA is our WFA, exclusive WFA associate for Qatar. Uh, we've worked on many projects together, and I've found that Hesham is, a, uh, is an intelligent and uh, very knowledgeable uh, business professional and franchise professional. And uh, I think you'll look forward to hearing what Hesham uh, has to say about bringing a franchise to the GCC region. Over to you, Hesham. Um, thank you, Troy. I appreciate the introduction and the opportunity. It's, it's, it's very nice to be here today. Uh, just allow me a minute to share my screen. Um, um, as, as Troy was saying, uh, today I'll be talking about the fundamentals or the key considerations you need to take into, into, into mind when, when, when trying to acquire a franchise and bring a franchise from abroad, especially some, someone that's new with international expansion with the GCC region. But before I start, just let me tell you a bit about my company. HECMA Consulting is a petite consultancy uh, operating out of Qatar. We, we, we specialize in a, in, a, in a whole range of services, and we are actually one of the very few companies in Qatar that, that work in the, in the field of franchising. So it's, 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 um, it's very, fortunate, very fortunate for us to be, to be part of this now, especially with what's going on with Qatar in terms of World Cup and, uh, and, and what's all the excitement that's coming up to this market. 
just a quick run about our core services. We, we do concept to consumer projects. We do retail consultation, restaurant consultation, business consultation, and franchise related services. I humbly come myself with uh, over 20 years of experience in international management, trade, business development, and I do have a strong focus on franchising. Uh, I was fortunate enough to, to bring to Qatar brands like Real Madrid, uh, Planet Hollywood, Lapel, Max Burger, and uh, Nine Round, which are all very well established, and some of them are even considered as iconic uh, uh, brands and franchises. So I was very fortunate to be able to bring such good household names to this market, and, and we continue to do that as, as we speak. Moving into the presentation, I think when you want to acquire a franchise, there are several key considerations you have to put yourself through. Some are internal and some are related to the brand. So internally, it all starts with, the, with, with, with what you want to do and whether you have the team to do it or not. It's, it's always difficult, no matter how experienced you are or no matter how well established you are to bring a franchise from, from one market to another. So, so the first thing that you need to know is whether you have the right, uh, the right manpower in terms of resources, experience, uh, um, attitude, culture, understanding into uh, uh, all of that to bring a brand from abroad. So I think the first thing that one needs to consider is whether him and his, uh, whether you or the team are ready to bring that specific franchise over. Then the next key consideration would be whether you have the financial uh, power to do that. It's, it's, it's franchising, acquiring franchises can be a bit expensive. There's, there's a bulk of investment that goes into acquiring the rights. And unfortunately, from my experience, I've seen a lot of people who, who do not understand the fundamentals of operating a franchise. To operate a franchise, you still have to have a certain amount of financial leverage. So it's not only about signing a franchise or acquiring the rights or having a contract in place where it says that you have the rights to a specific market. You have to also evaluate yourself financially and understand whether you can uh, continue to, to, to operate uh, smoothly once you want to launch your franchise. And then the next, the next question you need to ask yourself is whether you have enough reality uh, uh, or you're able to afford the required reality to launch your, your franchise in place and whether you have the proper connection or network with, with landlords, real estate companies, are you able to secure prime locations at competitive rates? Are they available for you? Um, is this something that you are comfortable with? Moving on, you would need to consider things like supply chain. Uh, some franchises require that certain products are imported, whether they are available locally or they're not available locally. So you have to also consider the cost of import. Is, the, is, that, is that something that is feasible and makes you competitive uh, once done or not? And then finally, you need to look into your development plan or the proposed development plan. Each brand comes with a development plan and some brands might be strict on the amount of, of outlets they want to see in a specific market, especially in big markets like uh, Saudi or Egypt or Dubai. Um, so you need to understand whether this development plan makes sense. Uh, are you confident that you can meet the commitments posed in the development plan during the specified timeline? This is something very important because a lot of people, when they come, they sign on a contract and then they get stuck into executing it. So we have to, so we have to make sure that execution is, uh, is actually sensible. And this is something that once committed to, you can actually deliver and continue to do. And then moving on to that. There are things you need to consider about the brand itself. And I know before we used to talk about profitability and margins and, and a, a different, completely different set of benchmarks. But, but today, the number one question that is posed to most brands, how Instagrammable are you? Social media today is the key driver to most businesses out there, regardless of, of, of the nature. And, and to have a strong social media presence on key platforms like Instagram or TikTok or Facebook, uh, it is something very important. And I think now it's, it's actually a, a fundamental criteria of choice. How, how social media savvy is the brand? The second question you need to look at is, is the franchisor or the brand ready for international expansion? 
there's a lot of brands that perform very well in their local markets. And there's a lot of brands that are doing fundamentally uh, uh, steady business there. But to, to, when, you, when it comes to international expansion, it's a completely different nature and a completely different ballgame, as they say. And like Troy touched on, we have a very uh, rich region. We have a very wealthy region. And unfortunately, sometimes that can work against us because sometimes brands perceive the Middle East as, 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 as money pots. And we've seen brands that were struggling locally and still wanted to go out to an international expansion. Now, sometimes that strategy works, but sometimes it doesn't. So, so you need to make sure that when you're looking at a brand that's internationally expansion, expanding, that it's actually a solid growth strategy and they're not doing it to survive whatever troubles they are having in their local markets. And then another key question to consider the overall profitability of the business. Do you, is there enough margins left? Because the GCC in general is a, is a, it's an expensive market when it comes to things like real estate and when it comes to things, things like manpower, uh, we, 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 we are, fairly more expensive than most of the local markets international brands are operating in. So we, you have to understand whether there's enough margins left for you once you have an operation set up. Uh, and you have to understand the overall performance of You do not get stuck with, with minimum bottom lines at the end and it doesn't become competitive enough for you to continue. Um, you can be performing again financially in a superb manner in local market, but but the costings would differ here in the region. So as somebody thinking of a franchise and somebody trying to acquire a franchise from overseas, this is something that really needs a good due diligence to be done on. Another consideration would be if the franchisor is 100% committed uh, in terms of growing the brand into your key market, because um, it's, not, it's not only about buying the systems and the tools and the processes. There's, there's a lot of operational flexibility that needs to be shown or demonstrated from the brand when it comes to, to penetrating the GCC market. There's a lot of cultural sensitivity. There's a lot of supply chain issues. There's a lot of challenges in terms of manpower, uh, availability of uh, prime spaces, uh, competing brands that are local. So yeah, you, when, when acquiring a franchise, you have to understand and be sure of uh, the flexibility in terms of change when it comes to these brands. Because sometimes, sometimes brands can be um, strict on, on the amount of leniency they will show. Uh, and, and sometimes this, this stiffness or strictness does not work into your interest. So I would say it's always best to look for a brand that shows flexibility and understanding that growing, um, growing a new market would require that you would step out of your comfort zone or, or, or the usual modes of business that you use. And then another key consideration is the brand culturally appropriate, especially in terms of marketing. Um, the brands that come into the GCC from, an in, from international markets can sometimes overlook the cultural sensitivity here in the region. We are a very open region. We are. Uh, a very friendly region, but but there are certain um, rules that we are still difficult to, to bypass. So it's always important to understand if the core offering, uh, in terms of the experience, the ambience, the product, the the marketing in particular, is not going to be culturally insensitive to most of your customers here, because that can work very um, very badly for you in a very good way. If, if that happens, and, and we've seen that unfortunately happen to some brands stepping into the region. They have to learn this the, the hard way. And then moving on, another question is that you need to consider, or another factor that you need to consider is whether the brand is millennial and doesn't approach the generation Z members, because um, now, I think brands have to be smarter in terms of technology and, and, and the way they pose themselves in terms of their operations. Uh, younger generations are, are very easily bored. And uh, one has to that the brand continues to engage, to engage this lab. Uh, so it's very important to understand that the brand is becoming technological. If it has applications out there, will you as a franchise need it? direct access to this technology once it's there, once it's available. And, and if the brand continues to evolve to, to ensure that it's still, um, it's still there when it comes to those 
uh, millennials. And also one of the key considerations, if, if the brand is easy to clone in the region in terms of, 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 uh, of, of the offering and the product, but most of these brands that come from overseas are business format franchises, and of course they are based on cloning. Uh, like I said, the region is not known to be, uh, or some markets are not known to be friendly when it comes to supply chain and imports. So it, you have to be sure that what you are, you are buying as a franchise can be easily executed in your key market. Another important consideration is, is the brand known for good publicity. Uh, we've seen brands recently that have fallen in their local markets with bad PR and that has affected their operations or their key, their key members or their key structures. And that did have an impact on some of their franchisees overseas. So it, it's very important that if you're gonna acquire a franchise that you actually invest in one that has a good reputation, proper CSR activities are welcomed in their local communities because that can directly impact you even if they're operating overseas. And then another key consideration, I think, in my opinion, is whether the franchise is offering proper support systems. Um, GCC markets need a lot of adaptation and a, a lot of, um, I would say, also manipulation when it comes to certain uh, policies, procedures, or ways of doing business. So it's very important to know that the brand can support you when you're, when you're facing these certain obstacles or hurdles and that they are willing to move over as well uh, to assist you even in terms of, of direct management to make sure that things or the business is run in a smooth and, and proper way. And then I think the final consideration that one needs to take into place is whether the brand is evolving in general. Uh, franchise contracts are known as marriages because they are very long tenor contracts. And you want to make sure that, that the brand in, in five, six, seven, 20, 25 years will still be there. So it's very important to understand if the franchisor is actually investing in evident development in terms of manpower, in terms of capital, and in terms of marketing as well, uh, product development. Um, it, it's very important to know that once you've established, you'll be there for a couple of many, many years uh, in business. And I, I think that concludes my presentation. I'm available for further discussions. Here are my contacts. It would be nice to hear from people who have attended. And I am going to leave this now in David's hands. Thank you. Thanks, Hesham. Great, great job. Very interesting uh, points of view. I, I really like the Instagrammable point, which is something you would have never had in a franchise market entry conversation even five or six years ago. Next, we have Mr. David Singleton. Um, as I mentioned earlier, he's a partner and strategic advisor in Socius, uh, based out of Dubai. Uh, David has been, been a friend of ours and, uh, um, and in contact and has worked with WFA over the years, and we've grown to know him and respect him. Uh, he's got a background with some, some iconic leading uh, international uh, franchise businesses, which I'll let him tell you about. Um, and on that note, note, over to you, David, uh, take it away. Uh, with me, come on, what's going on here? We hear you. Hi, there we go. I'm just trying to, just trying to share my everything here. Hi there, everybody. That's me. There we go. Here's my screen coming up. There we go. Well, good afternoon, uh, morning, evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is David Singleton, and uh, thank you to everybody. Uh, I'm based here in Dubai, and uh, where I uh, operate my business as a growth strategist and that of offering franchise expertise to those coming into the market. And um, Here's what we do. So, Socius Group, we're a we're a business development company, and I, and I my background has been in hospitality for the last uh, forty years or so, believe it or not. Um, but I but I've worked, I've developed brands, restaurant brands, retail brands uh, in forty countries around the world. 
uh, I don't uh, broker, so to speak. I leave that to the experts uh, uh, before me. I tend to work with brands <clears throat> and work with them on their market entry strategy or their growth strategy. Um, I also uh, work as a, as a leadership and executive coach with C-suite leaders, uh, CEOs, and teams um, from, from Dubai here. Um, so those, those are the kind of the three pillars of our business. These are a selection of some of the brands that, I, that I've worked with. I've advised these or work with them. Um, so as large as IKEA, where I advised on a franchise strategy for them, and Hauser Busch Inbev on their market entry strategy to the Middle East. And you can see all those other brands, uh, which are literally global brands um, uh, here. Right, so uh, a lot of our, uh, well, not a lot, but with Hesham and I, we, we both swim in the same sea, if you like. Hesham is over there in uh, Qatar. Uh, I'm here in Dubai. It's a big uh, part of the world here. It's a very, very active part of the world. So as uh, Troy said, some of my, our commentary may, may cross over. Um, so what about it? Um, you know, I, I was having a conversation earlier uh, with some people today that, uh, that it's quite a Dickensian view to think that actually the market is awash with opportunity, lines of investors and landlords and uh, uh, brand owners waiting at the airports for for us to rock up with brands. There is some opportunity and uh, uh, of course there is opportunity. Um, there are a lot of the operators here are truly maxed out. The, the market here, it really, really is booming at the moment. And that puts pressure on everybody. Um, customers are, are looking for more brands. The, yes, they are. And customers are craving newness and importantly, value. And um, the, the point there, lots of investment opportunity. Well, uh, the investment is always here. And, and in many cases, challenging to find. And in one of Troy's earlier slides, um, you know, he noted that actually there's a lot of high net worth uh, operators here. Yes, there are. And uh, not, just because you've got a lot of money doesn't mean you can run a restaurant brand um, or any brand for that matter. And, uh, and that finally, uh, people are making a fortune here. Yeah, people will always think we're earning a bucket load of cash here. Yes, there's a lot of money here. Yes, there's a lot of wealth here. We just got to go after uh, getting, the, uh, getting the right investor for the right brand. And I've done a slide here of where I see opportunity here. Uh, Saudi Arabia, undoubtedly exciting. And uh, uh, you know, there's abundant opportunity uh, here in or over there in Saudi Arabia. Again, not a lot of uh, capable, qualified operators out there to take brands. So you have to be really, really very careful about who you're partnering with. But to that point, there's also a lot of opportunity for new operators. And, and the great thing about Saudi Arabia is that uh, the operators there are prepared and ready to invest in the infrastructure and the organization that's required to uh, get that brand uh, or get their F&B business running. Uh, opportunity uh, in Qatar. You know, Hisham um, was talking about the excitement of Qatar, and there is right now, and it has been, I think, for quite some time uh, with the impending World Cup. I th what I, the, the caution I always um, uh, give, to, give to something like the World Cup Yes, you've got some lead up. Yes, you've got a six week or however many weeks event it is. And then it falls off the face of the earth um, in many cases. I'm not clear, and Hesham is the expert on Qatar, as to whether, um, uh, whether there is a legacy program in Qatar. I remember in, in the Russian World Cup, um, you know, Russia was transformed. You know, Moscow, St. Petersburg, I went to it. I had some business out there in my hard rock days. And, uh, and Moscow and St. Petersburg was a different place uh, for the World Cup and they had a legacy program. And I think if we're going there to Qatar right now, we just have to make sure that we're not bringing a brand for current excitement, we're bringing a brand there for longevity. Uh, franchising is in many respects about forming a very, very long-term relationship uh, with franchise or franchisee partnerships, call it whatever you like. 
And there is some opportunity in Kuwait, Bahrain, Oman. Uh, and, I, and I would suggest in that order, uh, albeit much of a muchness. So this is a, a model that I use. Um, and I think with Hesham, he, uh, Hesham goes into much more of the, the important detail behind what I'm going to talk about when, when it comes to talk about marketing, when it comes to talk about due diligence, et cetera. This is what I call my 12-point uh, my franchise success cycle. And uh, at the top of the uh, 12 o'clock there, you know, this is the brand. And, um, and then as we go around, you know, sat around the boardroom table, we've got our coffee shop, uh, steakhouse, whatever it is, you know, um, we need to make sure that our commercials are proven, everything's in place, and we have a model that actually we can go to market. And strategically, we then decide we are going to grow or we're going to have a, a growth strategy through franchise. And then what we do, we develop our strategy and so on and so forth. So I'm going to, so I'm going to talk us through that, those points. Um, but most importantly, let's assume that we've satisfied our hypotheses that we have something that is proven, it's commercial, we've, we've got board level uh, uh, decision making in place to franchise the business. So let's assume that we've gone through all that and we've listened to uh, a lot of Hesham's uh, sound advice there. And uh, we have a brand that we're demonstrable commercial modeling. So as a franchisee, you can demonstrate to me that in, the, in my own home market, um, my restaurant brand works. And here's my p &L where I can demonstrate that over a sustained period of time. In fact, you know, on that, you know, what we're also seeing now are brands that are being developed and created with a franchise strategy from the get-go. And that's very interesting. And I think we, we are seeing some of those. And my advice to that would be cautious. And so then we can get on with building our franchise strategy. So a lot of people will say to me, well, the GCC, the Middle East, Dubai, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, you know, it's hard, isn't it? Well, yes, it is. Um, but every part of the world uh, brings its own challenges, be they South America, be they South Asia, be they Asia, um, but anywhere away from your home country, or your home uh, homeland is going to be challenging. It's just, they're just different challenges, and it's not just the GCC. And it's important for you as the franchise owner uh, to really understand the region, look for the opportunities, and not necessarily just the potential challenges. Um, and, and I guess a lot, several of these slides up here are looking at looking at this through the lens of the franchise or. Um, if you're a franchisee watching this um, broadcast, then I guess you know, there's similar and sound uh, um, uh, advice within this. And I, th I think also understanding cultural differences from brand homeland is critical. Be ready to adapt to what I call glocalize your brand to uh, a new market. So, for example, if you're in a, you know, a mature market, you know, such as Europe or America, for example, your coffee shops and cafes are going to be quite small, aren't they? When you come to markets like the GCC, where culturally, you, you know, the locals like to relax and, uh, and meet with big groups, they like big chairs, they like big furniture, they like big tables, because they tend to buy a lot. And uh, so, it, so that's where we start to perhaps redesign your, your brand floor plan or your layout. Um, there was a time, you know, not up till uh, quite recently in Saudi Arabia, where you had to have actually two entrances and two very separate parts to, to your restaurant. That's now uh, gone and, uh, and you'll see in Saudi Arabia now where, where it is extremely vibrant over there and the cafe culture, restaurant culture there is, is, is exceptional. And uh, I'm over there in a couple of weeks to see and enjoy that. So understanding your franchise market's ways of doing business is critical. So you know, how do they do business? And the, the, there's a many municipality differences to your market, to, this, uh, to the market you're about to enter. Don't look to save costs on, on, on systems to optimise your franchise business. 
when you come to set up your franchise business, invest in this. It will be the best thing you ever do. And they're, they're your organizational systems, you know, uh, so you can you know, monitor your business. There could be labor uh, monitoring systems. There could be reputational management, you know, software to assist with um, stock control, inventory management, and things like that. Very, very important to make sure that you have a system set up that you can put into their business to make sure that your franchisee is optimized and you can monitor that business as well. Tech is very, very important. Build a development plan that's realistic and achievable. And I think we've all seen these fantastical uh, deals that uh, uh, people talk about when we go into these markets. You're 250 strong stores going into Saudi Arabia or the UAE. They, they're just not going to happen. And uh, so build a development plan that is realistic and achievable and you can overachieve it. That way you have a happy franchisee and you have a happy franchisor. Resource your franchise business to ensure that the franchisee is well supported. Your job is to enable your franchisee's success. It's very, very important. Very important. And very often we would advise uh, people to engage an advisor who is well networked and really does understand the region and and that's for many many uh, reasons you know how we do business in the uk germany america asia um, australia or wherever is very different to how business is is done in this part of the world and uh, it, it's it's very worthwhile to engage somebody like hasham or myself to advise or, or to oversee the entire market entry strategy for you. Um, and you know, once Troy's work is done, he's done the matchmaking, he's brought franchisee, franchise all together, then we can get on and hold the hands and just make sure no one falls down the rabbit holes that are there. All right, so planning for market entry, and I, and I think this is where Hisham and I start to cross over a little bit, but uh, I think everything, everything, is, everything is relevant. Um, what are the key challenges? Um, have patience. You're finalizing your deal takes time. It will not be done in a fortnight. I've worked on deals that have taken two years uh, to complete. It takes a long time. The important thing right from the outset is to be very, very clear in what you're asking the, of the brand, of the franchisor, and what you're asking of the franchisee and get those critical points agreed very, very early and make sure they're all in your LOI. Again, I've put it back in there and you'll see this repeated. Understand the region and the culture you're going into. Really, really understand it. Selecting the right partner. Hisham touched on this, didn't he? Making sure that you're bringing in the right partner that's going to run your brand. You know, very often you're going to be the the entrepreneur, the partner who has created this restaurant brand. And the, the last thing you want to do is put it in the hands of a rogue franchisee. You want someone that's going to love it even more than you. Your job is to make sure that, uh, that, that, that they're looking after it uh, for you. Do your due diligence. And that's you know, right the way through from, you, you know, from uh, financial uh, to cyber uh, due diligence uh, we, we do that you know we we've we actually do some very very deep dives on due diligence on on franchisees that are coming uh, that, that are potentially uh, gonna do, do business and that's I do that in my advisory role uh, make sure your partner is as meticulous as you are or more so make sure your marketing teams are aligned this is and a, a, a lot, an area that very often we take for granted that uh, as franchisors, that they have a franchise uh, marketing team in place. And very often that's when things go wrong. You know, just the smallest things like the use of logo, use of colors, use of fonts, use of imagery, the social that Hashan talked about, make sure that, that is right on brand and building your toolkit. This ensures your brand is very well executed in your new market and it's this all this upfront work you know from the top to the bottom of the of this cycle this is where you put all your effort into and uh, you know and and you have to allocate budget for this you know and you know from your legal fees for your franchise packets packages to your um, uh, manuals and your team and your everything so uh, and that's very very important that your and their support and leadership teams are 
fully, fully aligned and they're in place. That you as the franchisor have approved the leadership teams, the key leadership team of the franchise market that's going to be running your brand. Never forget that. This is your brand that someone else is going to be operating on your behalf. And then as we go around the cycle, we now come down to activating market entry. So, you know, everything's in place now, you know, so we're, we're in the boardroom, we're happy, we've got something that works, we've, got a, we've agreed a strategy to franchise, we've developed the, this, this strategy, we've got all our gear, we've got our packages, we've got our toolkits, we've got our manuals, and we're ready to go. And what's more, Troy has the partner that we're going to love and work together for 20 years with. We go to market, we visit the market, we understand the market. You know, as if we were an area manager in our own country, we go to that territory, don't we? We understand it. We know where the shops are. We know what people want to do every day. We go and visit the market we're going to go and operate in. But one of the reasons you are franchising is that you've got a franchisee that really, truly understands the market. So I'm, I'm not suggesting you become an expert in the towns and villages that you're going into. I'm saying you need to understand the market. Not yet, yet, and that's it. And then you rely on your franchisee to inform uh, and, and be your trusted partner there. Have very, very clear timeline in place. Have an online tool such as Teams or Slack to monitor activity and drive momentum. Keep it going, keep it going. And have a very clear timeline within your development plan. When does this first store open? And then you work it back. Your job as the franchisor is to share your knowledge and experience of the brand uh, with, with, you, with your new franchisees. These are going to be your new brand ambassadors in the new territory you're going with. Have very regular meetings with all departments, ops, marketing, HR, finance, supply chain. Everybody's got to be on their A game, guys. And that's your supply chain to their supply chain, your finance to their finance. They've got to be really, really working together, have regular meetings and make sure everybody understands each other and no stone is left unturned. Clarity uh, of understanding is truly, truly important. And then that goes back to my having your online tools such as Slack to perhaps monitor activity. Um, have focused meetings with design and construction. They're, they are going to be building your restaurant. Now, I suggest in the early times, you, you might want to be designing the restaurant for them, you know, and then you build that into your, into your uh, agreement that actually that's something that, that you uh, make a charge for. And, and in some cases, that sees it all the way through. But very often, you need to be making sure that your franchisee really understands uh, how to build this restaurant. Or if you are the franchisee, you want as much help as possible from the franchisor, don't you? Be relentless with detail. I cannot say that. Or I cannot say that often enough and you come into a new part of the world here and and those people who um, might be uh, residents here in, in the gcc who are, who are bringing in a global brand they need to truly truly understand the why at every point within your brand and sign off at critical points have critical points within your timeline where you sign off and then you gate and then you go again so this is really, really important about activating your market entry. Now you're open. Visit the market and understand the market. You've seen that several times now, haven't, I? haven't you? Go, go to the business and see how the, 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 the guests in that new restaurant are receiving it. And you may see some things that, that the franchisee isn't. And the franchisee is going to be looking to you for your, your endorsement. How am I doing? And what you really want is a very, very happy franchisee. Be relentless with detail, that's another thing I keep saying. Keep up the regular meetings. You might not have them as regular now. You might wanna have one in the early days, maybe every two weeks, every three weeks, and then they can, they can you know, become longer in between and as you become more confident with the brand execution. Very important, celebrate success. Celebrate success, put it on the social media, put it in the news channels. A, you know, a, a, a successful franchisee is your salesman and a wealthy franchisee is your salesman. And your role now is to support and allow them to get on with the business. And that's the beauty of franchising is that someone else is going to build your brand for you.
and 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 and, the, and your job is to make sure that your franchisee is well supported to become wealthy and then they become your active sales force and ambassadors that ladies and gentlemen is my session hopefully try uh, i've left you enough time for for questions great david thank thanks a lot uh, that was very useful and informative and uh, i think we all learned something from from um, your take on uh, and your perspective on this so much appreciated um, we will uh, we'll now open up to questions i've got uh, i've got some questions already which we've already received um, hesham i'll i'll start with you Thanks. The question, Hesham, is taking if somebody wants to bring a brand to to the GCC or to Qatar where you're at, and they and they're looking at at uh, planning in the initial stage, just from the beginning of discussions to signing a franchise agreement, a master franchise agreement, or area development agreement. How long would that typically take, in your opinion? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I would say the decision-making process in Qatar is um, is not as rapid as people would like it to be. Uh, it, 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 it would take anything between six to eight months just to sign an agreement. However, as we move closer and closer to the World Cup, uh, I, I see that pace definitely changing. Uh, most of the projects related to the World Cup are complete and the market is growing dynamically to, 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 to welcome the World Cup fans. Um, so honestly, Troy, if you ask me this question a year ago, I'd say six to eight months, but now I think it would be anything between three to six months uh, because um, as, as we approach the tournament as well, as we approach the event, uh, a lot of things are, are, are signing off. A reality year is, is becoming very dynamic. We're, we're, a lot of prime locations have opened up in the market in the last two or three months. We've had um, at least two new prime locations come into the scene. Um, if you talk to the real estate agents, it's the busiest time in the world for them now to secure outlets and to secure you know points for the for, for the network and stuff like that. So it's it's um it's a very dynamic time and there's a lot of momentum in the market at the moment. So I'd say in Qatar, anything between two, three to six months now as as we gear up to the World Cup. That's interesting, oh, Troy. Oh. I, I did I did a um, deal in in Doha, and. And I said to the uh, potential owner, so I've got a brand I want to show you. And he said, cool, get it up on the screen. Boss, up it went. I'll have it. I'll have it. Deal done. Literally as fast as that. It took about a year to get the contract signed. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think we've all had those experiences where, where yeah. things you know, take longer than you expect. But, but sometimes you got to remember it's not a... It's not a hundred yard, hundred meter dash. It's a marathon um, because yes. the franchise agreement is ten plus ten, uh, you know, years. Uh, you raise a family in twenty years, and that's the term of your franchise agreement. So it's better not to not to rush in. To be honest, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you, the lawyers also they, they make it aggravating as we go along. Uh, so so a lot of that time is spent between. I see everybody nods their head and say, "Yep, we all we all got stuck in that in that yeah. legal, legal part of the process," but. Um, I'll tell you now, there's something also about Qatar, and it's very evident. I've been in this market for over now. Directly, I've been here for 16, 17 years working. And, I, and I'll tell you this, um, Qatar has a very, very uh, open strategy when it comes to tourism and when it comes to, to, to shifting gears from being an oil and gas country to, to a, a touristic-based country. So, so we are seeing a lot of, um, of uh, mixed-use developments coming up now. Um, I, I, I would definitely say there's a bit of limiting Dubai there. We're, we're not going as fast as Saudi because we have a global event that's happening. So some things are going to slow down. To, to, it, for, 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 I would say, um, not market-related reasons, but, but for, for political reasons, some things will slow down. But I see that this momentum will continue um, after the World Cup as, as Qatar starts to implement its national tourism map. And, and, and uh, they have a national tourism vision that's coming up. And uh, there's a lot of entertainment and leisure areas coming onto the scene now. Uh, some are to be complete before the World Cup, for sure that's granted, and some will continue 
Um, just today, they've announced a mixed-use development, 230 square meters, called Anaha Island. It's part of Losail City, which was a city that's uh, it's a it's a new extent. Um, they, they they plan to complete it in a year's time. So so like I said, I think the market will be dynamic in Qatar, definitely for the next year or so. And with, with such momentum and and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Yeah, with such momentum and and. Uh, and change, the, the decision-making process must evolve as well as we go along. So I think that it will not take us as much to sign contracts. I know it becomes frustrating, David. I've been there, I've done that. And I, Troy knows I have a ton of t-shirts, not, not just one. But um, but I think things will, will start to gear up uh, uh, quicker uh, as we progress in the next two to three years at least especially with what's going on in Saudi and the competition Saudi is posing um, as, 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 a, as a tourist destination now. Um, I think Saudi have done, and I'm, I'm glad you touched on this, David, because Saudi have done a phenomenal job in the past two to three years mm. when it comes to the amount of change we have seen uh, coming out of there. So I think Saudi really is competing now uh, yeah. with, with prime established markets like UAE. And I think with the pace that Saudi is moving at, a lot of countries will start to put their running shoes on. I agree. Excellent. I agree. Okay, let's. Uh, we have another question, which is, which is from a slightly different perspective. Um, it, it's a question uh, I'll, I'll pose to you, David. Uh, you, you you talked a lot about uh, you know strategy and uh, and kind of the you know the top down look at at a brand bringing a, you know, what a brand needs to do to, to expand internationally or come to the GCC. There's a, you used to hear these, these uh, old school franchise development people, you know, you say, well, what are you gonna do to adopt to the local market? They'll say, oh, we'll just use the 80-20 rule. You know, the 80%, you can't touch it. And, you know, the 20% will, will let them, um, you know, modify and alter. I, I've got my views on that. I'm curious, what do you think about uh, that kind of, uh, uh, you know, that 80-20 approach and and the, either the pros and cons of, of, of thinking like that? People have come to buy your brand because they want your brand, because they believe your brand is going to work for their market. So um, so what they're not going to do is, is take your brand and just change it wholesale. And so let's take, let's take Hard Rock as an example. I, I ran Hard Rock. Uh, at one stage. So we, we were militant when it came to the detail of the brand and the, and the brand construction and, the, and, and how we use the brand, etc. However, we did allow for flex around the world in, 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 in various countries. So if we were in India, we, we would have, a, uh, you know, they, they might be smaller locations. The, the memorabilia Within the within the store would be pointed to that part of the world, um, and it's and it's the same for here. And there may be items within the menu that we we might want to customize uh, to to that part of the world, and that might be for taste profile. It might be dish sizes. Here, you know, we don't have bacon or pork, for example, within the menu. So how do we adapt the menu uh, for those kind of things? Um, I talked earlier about. Furniture, you know, furniture layout, um, you, you know. So uh, what, what's very, very important is your, you, your brand is, is your brand and it's recognized as uh, you know, around the world. You know, you know, if you go to a McDonald's, they're different all the way around the world, but you certainly know you're in a McDonald's, don't you? And, uh, and that's, that's really, really important. Uh, so anybody who says, you know, you're not going to change the brand for whatever, well, you, you're onto a losing wicket. And, uh, but I don't, I don't think there's an 80-20 per se, but I don't think that's a bad um, uh, ratio to, to consider. Interesting. Hesham, a question for you. If someone came to you and said, I've got, you know, I've, I, I'm a successful businessman in in my my sector, um, retail or or whatever trade, and um, and I want to acquire a food franchise for for my country. Um, you know, what do I need to do? What's the first thing you would say to them? 
um, let me look into your management team because it's all about hiring the right people, man. If, if you're able, if you have look, if you have the financial leverage and the backbone, you can always bring the necessary resources. And there's a lot of qualified people in the region. So um, the region now is very open and cross recruitment is happening everywhere. Um, so I would I wouldn't shut them off, Troy. I would just say, look, in order for you to succeed, you need to have these resources in place. If you have them, great. If you don't, then you need to invest in the right people and the right team before we even put you forward as a candidate to that profile. Because I, as as you know, Troy, for for for, for the fact that most of the prime brands, especially when it comes to the to, to, to the alpha F and B brands, they're not looking for money anymore. As much as they're looking for the quite the culture, the people, the management team, uh, you know, the longevity. Yeah, and, and it's all about really, I think most of the prime brands are looking more about the understanding between both ends of the spectrum more than uh, how much money is being put out of the pocket. So, so it, it, it's all about building the right team. If you have the right team in place and you have the financial backbone to do so, because I also know for a the fact there's a lot of rich operators out, out there and I think David can definitely touch on this. There's a lot of household names when it comes to operators and they're very rich and they're very wealthy, but the, the management structure they have <clears throat> or the people who might be currently on board are not as, as friendly as they should be. And it's still difficult to, 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 to sell them to a brand, even though they come with all of these, you know, pockets of cash and multiple openings and, and, and cross markets here and there. Um, and I, I think both ends have become much more educated. The process itself of acquiring a franchise and what franchisees are looking for and what franchisors are looking for has also evolved a lot. Um, during the past five years, I wouldn't even say that. So it, it's, it's, it's really more about the people because at the end, franchise is a people's business. This is something a lot of people who are not in the industry, you know, might notice, but people who are, it, it, it's really about people. And, and it's people who drive the change and it's people who are flexible and it's people who are willing to listen and to understand that, like, like David said, you know, it doesn't, just because I'm doing phenomenally well in the UK, doesn't mean I'm gonna come to a market as big as Saudi and Egypt and just rock it off. But I might come and I might, you know, flung big time. And there's a lot of people who did. And, and the hardest thing to, if, after you fail in a market is to come back. And I think everybody knows that as well. Mm. So it's all about people. If you have the right people in place, yes. If you, if you don't and you are willing to bring them on board, then yes. If no, no, then move on. I can probably say without exception, all the franchise brands I've worked with, the, the more successful they are, is down to the people, it's down to the leadership and the owners of that brand and, and how they make sure that the franchise partners are reflective of that culture. It's so important. And I've never heard the analogy, Troy, if it takes 20 years to build a family, it takes years to, it's the life cycle of, of a franchise. It's, it's absolutely right. Um, yeah, so people all the way. It has to be a fair relationship because it's it's a very it's a very long term relationship as well. So it has to it has to be you no. Know, everybody says it's a win win, but it really has to be a win win. And you can and have some tough conversations along the way, aren't you? And you and you and you and you really are. It's not all a bed of roses. There's going to be at some point where you're going to have to have a tough conversation. That could be about development plan, payment schedule. You're going to ask them to invest in into the business, maybe a rebranding, maybe a new menu, maybe it's something seasonal, whatever it is, you know, and, and your powers of persuasion and how you engage and work with your partner is absolutely critical. Absolutely. Yeah, there's no, there's so, no doubt. That. <clears throat> I think, you know, everybody agrees people is, is a key, um, the right people, the right team. Um, David, after people, if you had to um, generalize um, brands who have come to the GCC and in, in, in ENA region that have failed, aside from or in addition to having the wrong team or people, what would you say is the other other big reason that brands fail in the GCC and in, in ENA region? Having a point of difference. You know, come into the market without having a point of difference. You know, don't bother coming to market if you don't have a point of difference. You know, what, what have you got that no one else has got here? You, you know, if you're just going to come in and you're just going to be another Me Too burger brand or another Me Too steakhouse or salad bar, don't waste your time. Uh, have a point of difference and, you'll, and you will thrive. And that's the word that we really love. You know, thrive. You know, you know, otherwise, what's the point in doing this? 
what, what, what do you think about real estate? I mean, I, I'm told and I've seen a lot of uh, people rush out and go for the Dubai Mall or the Mall of the Emirates and and they, you know, they, they only think about that first location and they don't map the market and have a market entry strategy. And therefore, you know, they're, yeah. they've got a huge flagship paying, you know, nosebleed rental and they don't know where to go from there. Is that, is that, does that make yeah. sense? Or? It's really interesting. I, I, today, we just agreed a deal uh, for a brand that's going to come in from the UK. And we've taken a really cool little neighborhood space, you, you know, there are 300,000 residents around this three and a half thousand square foot box. If that won't succeed, I don't know what will, you know. So, uh, you know, they all live there. You know, we got breakfast through to lunch, through to afternoon, through the evening. We've got delivery. We've got some commercial. You, you know, we, we've got a yacht club nearby. You know, we've got everything there. And so you, you're right, Troy. Let's think outside the box. And we don't have to spend 800 dirhams a square foot and, 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 and get tied in and you get all, you, you know, but, you know, some people like to launch themselves into the Dubai Mall. Dubai Mall is the biggest mall on the planet. And there's a queue of people around the block waiting to go in there. I, I, I completely agree with what David said. I've seen, I've seen brands coming to Dubai in particular that, that, that contract being in Dubai Mall as the yep. first opening in Dubai. Yeah. And they were in Soyapo. But, you know, it, it's, um, you have to, um, and, and this is a typical example when I say hire someone like Hisham or myself. We know the landlords and we know how to do business. And if you come marching up and you talk to these landlords, here's my deck, I want a, I want a box in your mall. Well, you'll fall at the first fence if you're using a racing analogy. You know, come to us and we, we'll, we'll, we'll talk and share with you and we'll coach you. This is what your brand deck needs to look like. This is how you need to shape it. This is what you need to ask for. This is what you need to present. This is what you need to budget for. This is the conversations you need to have. And it's all of these things. Uh, and then you know, I've rewritten brand decks for people after they've been turned away because it's not, it's not the leasing manager that's going to agree to it. It's, you know, you've, you've gone over the first fence then. And then all this is going to go to an executive committee that's going to decide whether this brand is going to come to our mall because they can do that. They can pick and choose. And you can go all the way through. You can assign your LOI. You could have had your checkbook ready to go. And then you get turned down uh, because that's not the right fit in the view of the executives. So have a very strategic plan for the brand as, as for your market entry. And really think about, you know, could we put six or eight locations of your coffee shop in Dubai? Yeah, probably. All right, where? And, and, what, if you, and what if the market changes in three years? Because three years, things change like that here. Sure. And, uh, and you've got to be really agile and really fleet of foot. I think it's a really good question, Troy. And uh, just, I, I, I just want to agree with you. Sorry, sorry Hesham. We, we've... Uh, Money at the time. Yeah, yeah. The or, the organizer who's been gracious enough to give us an hour on their on their stage has told me that we've uh, we've gone over time, and uh, so I'd like to uh, to thank uh, Index for for inviting myself and Esham and David to to spend an hour with you. Um, I'd like to thank all of you who joined us for giving us an hour of your time and listening to us, and uh, it's a pleasure having you uh, with us. Uh, we wish you all the best in your franchise endeavors. Uh, just to end the the uh, the webinar, I'd like to tell you about the next webinar, which is on the 14th of June at 4 p.m., 4 to 5 p.m. Dubai time, and it's called Sustainable Growth and Soaring Success for Franchisors. Again, hosted by by Index Conferences and Exhibitions and the a uh, day or evening or morning wherever you may be take care everybody take care cheers bye everyone thank you